In this video, we're going to be investigating one of the most well-known sequences in mathematics, the Fibonacci sequence. This is a recursive sequence, meaning we have to use the previous terms to calculate the next one. Let's see how it's defined. The nth Fibonacci number, denoted Fn, is equal to the sum of the previous two, and the first two numbers are both 1. So using this recursive definition, we need to know the previous two numbers if we want to find any more. If we could find a closed form, that is, an expression which only depends on n, and none of the other Fibonacci numbers, we could calculate any particular one without having to calculate all of its predecessors. This would be very helpful in calculations. You might have heard that if you divide two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, this value approaches the golden ratio, denoted phi. Here are a couple of examples, and they seem to be approaching a value of about 1.618. This fact is true and can be proven using limits. Let's explore what this means for large Fibonacci numbers. If we take x to be a very large Fibonacci number, we know that the next one is approximately phi x, and the one after that will be approximately phi squared x. However, we also know that the sum of these two should equal the third. This gives us x plus phi x is approximately phi squared x. As x grows, this will become equality. We can also divide by x on both sides, giving us 1 plus phi is phi squared. This reveals a very interesting property of the golden ratio, that squaring it is the same as adding 1 but it also allows us to calculate its exact value with the quadratic formula. Since we calculated phi to be positive earlier, we take the positive root to be phi, and the negative one is another number known as psi. Since we can approximate Fibonacci numbers by multiplying by phi, naively, we might try to approximate the nth Fibonacci number by powers of phi. f2 is 1, so f3 is approximately phi, and f4 is approximately phi squared, and so on. This reveals the approximation, fn is approximately phi to the n minus 2. If we plot these on a graph, we can see it does in fact work as an approximation, but they do stray away from one another quickly, and by the 40th Fibonacci number, there's a 15% error. This is not great. While our first attempt was not so accurate, it did reveal that powers of phi are related to the Fibonacci numbers. Let's look at some. Phi to the 0 is 1, and phi to the 1 is 5, of course, but we know that phi squared can be written as phi plus 1. Let's keep going, replacing any instance of phi squared with phi plus 1. Have you noticed the pattern? The coefficients here match the Fibonacci numbers exactly, with the integer part of the expression being 1 earlier. You can prove this fact with induction, but this is a pretty standard induction proof, so I won't go through all the details. We can see that we can write phi to the n as fn times phi plus fn minus 1. We can find powers of phi numerically, but we can't rearrange this expression for fn, since there's two Fibonacci numbers. Remember our other solution to our quadratic from earlier, psi? Since we only use the relation phi squared is phi plus 1, which is also true for psi, everything we just did for phi holds also for psi. This gives us two relations, and therefore we then do simultaneous equations to eliminate fn minus 1 and we can rearrange this for fn. This gives us a formula for fn in terms of powers of phi and psi, exactly what we were looking for. Now we can calculate whichever Fibonacci number we want, just by plugging values into this equation. You may have noticed also that this expression doesn't limit the type of number we input. For instance, we can easily plug minus 1 in for n and find the minus first Fibonacci number. Interesting. Furthermore, there's nothing stopping us from putting numbers which aren't whole into this expression like one half. Well, almost nothing. If we try plugging in one half, we notice that since psi is negative, we have the square root of a negative number, which famously does not exist in the real numbers. We can broaden our scope to the complex numbers by letting the square root of minus one equal to i. This allows us to find the one half Fibonacci number. And in fact, any real number can be plugged in this way. This is the complex plane and we can plot complex numbers here by plotting their real part as the x and their imaginary part as the y. If we plot all the Fibonacci numbers, even the fractional ones, we get this beautiful curve. If we never tried to calculate the Fibonacci numbers this way, we never would have found this curve or any of these fractional Fibonacci numbers. Thank you for watching my second video on this channel. I hope you enjoyed, and since you watched all the way through, please like and subscribe. If you want me to cover another topic, leave it in a comment down below. Thank you.